for me to to say from this book. There is only six chapters in First Timothy, and and uh, but but part of the problem, uh, pr- not problem. Part of the reason that I just see so much in it is I understand that when you come to First Timothy, you're coming to the first of what we call pastoral epistles or church epistles, because now after we've gone through Paul's epistles and learned the doctrine of grace, now God has rested that, gospel, that, that doctrine in the hands of a local church that Paul, he's ready to pass the baton down to Timothy. Uh, but Timothy isn't, uh, when we get to 2 Timothy, he's told the things that he's learned from Paul that he's to pass down to others who are going to teach others and so it's going to be a succession. And so when you come to these church epistles, First and 2 Timothy uh, and, and Titus, even Philemon, that these are, um, th- th- this is the local church that's now responsible for the doctrine that Paul was given and, and that Paul wrote and gave to us Gentiles, it's our responsibility to carry it on and, and God instituted the local church for that reason. Uh, you, you see in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul going out and everywhere he went, he started a local church. He would first get some people saved, then he would backtrack and out of those people who got saved, he'd appoint elders in every city and then uh, make them responsible for teaching further. And even in the early church, uh, we have to acknowledge the fact that because until Paul's epistles got written, there were prophets in those churches where God didn't just leave them without, you know, Paul leaves, now they don't have a message. Well, no, there was prophets that would speak and, uh, and further them in the understanding of grace. And those prophecies would end when God's word is complete because God's word now is the, the means by which we know the truth of God's grace. But the, my point is, is that God instituted a local church. And, and I mean, that's really dear to my, my heart as, as I've given my life to the ministry in the local church. And many of you have as well, whether in offices of the church or in attendance of the church. But, you know, it's amazing when you think about it. When you start early, the early chapters of Genesis, you begin to realize in those first 11 chapters, God instituted four divine institutions. I mean, the first thing is, we always we call it volition, is Adam had freedom of choice. And, uh, and it begins to set a foundation. And then, uh, even though he made wrong choices, he's still responsible for the right choice as uh, conscience kicks in after that. But then God also instituted right from the very beginning marriage. They said it wasn't good for man to be alone. And he instituted marriage. And then uh, the, the idea of marriage then is to multiply and replenish the earth. And so from marriage you ended up with the institution of family. Where you have a child being raised by two parents who know their responsibility before God in raising this child. And then as man began to multiply on the earth, then after, you know, the, the imagination of man was only evil continually. God judged the world with a flood, but made another institution after that, human government. That man, as he, as he now multiplies in the earth again after the flood, now man has the responsibility of keeping law and order. And part of that law and order, uh, the first thing that God instituted, he gave to man, is the, the right to put another man to death. That if, by, if a man kills, sheds blood, by, by man shall his blood be shed. And uh, so capital punishment, and that, that's where you start seeing that the, the forming of governments, and as men multiplied from, from families into uh, uh, like tribes and into nations and into lands, then, uh, then there's a government in all those areas, and that, that government is instituted by God. That's Romans chapter 13 tells us that then you don't see God instituting anything except that in the, in the governments of the nations, uh, as the nations turned from God, God took one of those nations and, and made them his nation, the nation of Israel. So he didn't institute a, a, a new institution, but he made a certain nation his people, gave them his laws, so that they would have a nation being run the way God would have it to run, so that they might be a testimony to the other nations. But when God in the book of Acts, turned from the nation of Israel, and rather bringing judgment on this earth, turned to us Gentiles in his grace to form the body of Christ, God created a new institution. And it's the institution of the local church. And, uh, and, and it's the means by which God's not working with nations today. He's working with individuals, but those individuals are called out from unbelievers in, in, by the gospel into faith, and then and then not just left to ourselves, that we're called into a local assembly as well. 
And we keep emphasizing what Paul's saying, the purpose of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13, uh, verse 14. It says, These things write I unto, you, unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of, the, uh, in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And uh, so we've talked about the church being the called out assembly of God's people. And, uh, and we're, we're the house of God, where we house God. And, that's, and, and that he's also called, it's, uh, the church is called the church of the living God. And in the sense that God is alive and well on planet earth today, living in his people. And not just as individuals, but as a called out assembly of believers. And we are the church of the living God. And, and as the church of the living God, we're the pillar and ground of the truth. A pillar is a support, a prop. And, uh, and, and we're the support of the truth. I, I, I've often done this. Is I've always thought about uh, Samson and the two columns that he was between. I mean, that held up the whole building. He pushed it down, the building collapsed. <laughs> well, that just shows you that a column or a pillar supports things. And that the church is not the truth. We're the pillar and ground of the truth. We're, we're as pillars, we support the truth. Uh, and, and in that, in the other sense of that, in Genesis, in the early chapters of Genesis, uh, Jacob, when he had that dream about the ladder that ascended up into heaven and angels ascending and descending uh, on that or the opposite of that, on that ladder, he, uh, he built, he took a bunch of stones and built a pillar, it says. Because God had made a promise to him and he made an oath to God. And, and then years later, when he returns to that place, even before he gets there, God says, remember the place where you built that pillar. And that pillar represents a testimony, represents a witness of, of what God, what he promised God and what God promised him. So that when you think about the use of a pillar and the support of it, you realize it's a, it's a witness. It doesn't just, just doesn't support the truth, it gives a witness to that truth. So the church of, uh, the, of the living God is the pillar and the ground of the truth. And as the ground, I've got to be careful in my wording here, the ground is, when you look at the meaning of the word itself, you know what ground is, <laughs> but, but it has to do with something firm and, and something stable. Uh, that's why earthquakes are so scary, because everybody expects the ground <laughs> to be firm and stable. But the, the ground is not the foundation. It, it, we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that Jesus Christ is the foundation. And the Apostle Paul there declares himself to be the wise master builder that builds on the foundation. Another foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But then Paul is the master builder. What's supposed to be built on Jesus Christ? Well, the first thing you do after you lay a foundation is you pour the floor. <laughs> and that becomes the ground of it. And, and so the, it, it's as, as if the church of the living God is, is poured out on Jesus Christ. It's where the truth rests on us. And boy, that's the, as you go through 1 Timothy, you realize that there's an entrustment of truth. And that the truth is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation, but that the ground rests on that foundation. And the truth is resting on us, and, and so we're responsible for it, and part of that responsibility is to support it and, and make it known. And, uh, and so Paul writes Timothy concerning the, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And when it says the pillar and ground of the truth, now there's a couple different ways we're going to look at this, but when, when you talk about truth, we're talking about the truth that God gave to Paul to us. You know, last week, and, and I say, I know I'm just in thinking all these different thoughts about this. By the way, Pastor Jordan miraculously taught about 1 Timothy, two of the lessons yesterday. So I didn't realize he must be watching our stream and video and learning from us. <laughs> but last week, I, I kind of got a little foolish in the sense that I started thinking, we, we look back at Acts and Paul's, we, we, even the first week we talked about Ephesus being a, a special church uh, that has a, a testimony both for us and for kingdom saints. Uh, that might be two different you know, churches involved there, but, but Ephesus itself, how it was used. But I, I started thinking foolishly about the size of the church at Ephesus. And I say foolishly because in, in the sense it was real big. People were burning books and everything else. But then when, when it came to against the society of Ephesus, uh, the whole city comes up in an uproar against what Paul was teaching. 
So you wonder, it was a church large in number, we can't really figure out a number, but the whole purpose of that was not so much the number, it was to realize that, and, and to emphasize the fact that when Paul was establishing churches, two things, that those churches that were being established were, first of all, all grace churches. Because in our mind, when we think of churches, we don't think biblically, because we think about what's all around us. And, that, and really what we're thinking about is denominationalism religious institutions and and so it really clouds our thinking because that's not what the church is and then then the other part of that is that no matter how long Paul stayed somewhere or something they, those churches probably weren't large in number they weren't mega churches when Paul left I, you can figure out the number what you want but the point is is God has always used small things to do his work and uh, and I say that because as I think about the church, the pillar and ground of the truth, and start talking about the truth, there is no doubt that the truth that's being emphasized in 1 Timothy and throughout all Paul's writing is the revelation of truth that was given to Paul. Well, how many churches, <laughs> religious institutions out there are doing that? They're, they're not the church then. And certainly the truth isn't resting on them, and they're not the pillar of it. And so, as small as we are, with the understanding of right division and the understanding of what truth we're talking about, really makes this little ministry extremely important. And, uh, and, and the things that are written in Timothy for us to maintain and to uh, 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 be entrusted with and committed to, uh, it just becomes extremely important. And that we, one day I was, when I ran cross country, <laughs> I wasn't good. I wasn't even in, even when I was just, I forget what year I ran it, but anyhow, I never made the senior uh, team. I was always in the JV team, and I was always in the back of the JV team. The only reason I hung in there is the coach said at the beginning, whether you're, you're gonna, we're going to find out if you're a man or not, because he said everybody's going to drop out because, you know, run you to death. And so I determined I was gonna, not going to drop out, but I was no good to the team because I couldn't make any points. But one time we were running a, 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 a course, and I knew the guys in front of me that they ran the wrong course. They went down around this tree, but that was on the second lap. The first lap, you're supposed to just go left. So I knew to go left, and I'm with the, the other team, but now I'm the leader of our school. And uh, there, no, there's, you know, I thought, there's no hope here. <laughs> and there, there was it before the, you know, we ran a mile or two miles. Anyhow, before I was done, here comes the first place guy passing me up. Go get him! <laughs> Next guy. <laughs> but I felt the pressure <laughs> of, of leading the team. Well, I, when you study First Timothy and realize other people aren't doing what these verses are telling you to do, boy, you, you feel the pressure to make sure you do it. And uh, so anyhow, I... I when we say the pillar and ground of the truth, look back at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and the mentions of truth. I'm not going to go through Paul's epistles. Uh, we might do that in some other verses here. But in 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, it's talking about God's will. It says, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And then it starts acknowledging the truth of, of the gospel in the sense that there's only one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. But God's will is for all men to be saved, and it's going to have to be through Jesus Christ. But when it talks about uh, not only be saved, but come to the knowledge of the truth, keep following along. It says in verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. That's truth. And so when he says all, to come to the knowledge of the truth, we're talking about the knowledge of the truth about how to be saved through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the, the ransom and the meteorship of, meteor, meteor, yeah, ship of Jesus Christ, and, but also the truth that the apostle Paul was, a revel, was given the revelation of. And so when you realize the church is the pillar and ground of the truth, it's not the truth about Moses or uh, uh, that was given to Moses or the truth about the kingdom program of the prophetic saints. It's particularly the, church, the truth about the, the age in which we're living in today, the truth that was given to the Apostle Paul. Um, in chapter 3 and verse 15, it says, uh, oh, that's the one we're talking about, the pillar and ground of the truth. We can go on to chapter 4, verse 3. Uh, it says, forbidding to marry, and this is some doctrines, the false doctrines, we'll talk about them another time, 
forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them that believe and know the truth. The truth is going to keep you from the false doctrine that's out there. But uh, there's an emphasis as you go through this passage, this book about truth. Um, chapter 6 and, and verse 5. Uh, <laughs> It talks about, uh, well, back in verse 3, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine according to the godliness, and it starts, it just lays this man out. He's proud, knowing nothing, doting about questions, and strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, ra uh, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, but here it is, destitute of the truth. If they're teaching otherwise, than what Paul taught and was given to Paul, they're destitute of the truth. Man. <laughs> the, the, I mean, you don't give them any leeway there at all. Uh, supposing that gain is godliness, and that's, that's where they go when they really don't have the, they're not really following the truth. But when we talk about the word of truth, that we're the pillar and ground of the truth, even though we're not in 2 Timothy, you know where we're going here. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Timothy's told to, be, to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So that when we talk about the word of truth, uh, it's certainly, when you, when you add the right division part, then you realize there is truth all throughout the Bible. But the truth we're talking about in Timothy, the truth that we, the church, the body of Christ, are responsible for, is the truth of the dispensation of the grace of God. Uh, the age in which we're living in. And that's why we're to rightly divide the word of truth so that we can declare the truth. And, and these guys that weren't rightly dividing the word of truth, saying the resurrection has passed already, uh, it says, verse 18, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection has passed already and overthrew the faith of some. They weren't dividing correctly. And they were into preterism and other things. And, uh, and so they have... Uh, the, concerning the truth, they, they've erred. And then, even the end of this chapter, uh, it talks about those that are, uh, verse 24, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, which are taken captive by him at his will. When you're not in the truth then you're just stepping in the trap of Satan and the only way to recover, be recovered is someone patiently teaching you and God sparing the, the end of the age of grace so that you have time to recover yourself by believing the truth. And, uh, and what, what they need to do is acknowledge the truth. Um, so that there's this emphasis in truth. And just kind of finish the Second Timothy out, chapter 3 of Second Timothy, verse 7. It says, uh, concerning certain ones, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then he uses uh, an example of the Old Testament. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, retrobate concerning the faith. And, uh, and then chapter 4 and verse 4 says, uh, and they shall turn away their ears, that's the false teachers, they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables, or it's the people listening to the teachers, uh, but they turn away from the truth. So, so when we're talking about the church being the pillar and ground of the truth, we're talking about the truth that was given and the Apostle Paul was given to him and that he commits to Timothy. So we, we've talked about this already, but because of what I'm just saying here, I want to do that again, is that, that Timothy is now being charged with a commitment of the trust of the truth of God's word for us today. And, and, and it's what was given to Paul, Paul has commissioned Timothy with it, but Timothy is responsible now to commission the, the local assemblies to carry it out. And by the way, I was thinking about that. When we talk about God instituting the local church, He didn't institute one giant church. Now, there is one giant church that all believers are in Christ, so it's a universal church. But when you read these passages, you're talking about, when it says the church at Ephesus, you're talking about a local church and the leadership of a local church. And every individual local church is autonomous in the sense that they're self-governed and they're responsible for the things that Timothy is passing down. 
And, and the wisdom of God in doing that is if, if everything was under one headship, all Satan's got to do is get corrupt that headship, that leadership, and he deceives everybody. But God puts that responsibility in, in the leadership of every local church and gives us the same, the faith, uh, body of truth that we're to believe and to stand for. Um, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, when Paul immediately introduces to Timothy this responsibility, what this book is about. He says, as I, bought, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now what I want you to see in that verse is charge some. Almost like a military thing. This is, you know, when you got orders, you don't deviate from that order. And so Timothy has already learned, and you'll see that, that Paul commits some things to Timothy, but Timothy is going to charge that leadership at Ephesus that they don't teach any other doctrine. And certainly that's any other doctrine than, than what has been revealed through Paul for us as members of the body of Christ. Uh, verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. Well, you get an idea what no other doctrine other than what? The glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. But the, again, that emphasis, God committed that message to Paul's trust. He entrusted Paul with that message. And so Paul, look at verse 18 of chapter 1. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before thee, that thou, mayest, uh, uh, that thou by them mayest war a good warfare. Timothy, what was entrusted with Paul, Paul's entrusted it with Timothy, and telling Timothy, go to Ephesus and tell them they don't, they're not there to be entrusted with this message as well, and they shouldn't teach any other doctrine. And, uh, and so there's this uh, embodiment of truth that we're being charged with and entrusted with. Uh, if we, it doesn't use the word trust or charge or commit. Uh, in verses cha in chapters two or three here, but there's when you read through it, you realize the authority of the apostle Paul and what was given to him is our doctrine for today. In such words that we, we pointed out that when you get to chapter two here, that when he starts talking about prayer and, and who should pray, we're talking about the 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 ministry within the local assembly. We're not talking about you praying at home and make sure you pray and your wife doesn't. We're talking about in the local assembly, but it's not the instructions I want to point out right now. It's, it's Paul's statement here when he uh, makes a statement like, I exhort in verse 1. So that the, here's, here's some things to be praying about, and we get an idea why to pray for them. Uh, we'll bring that out in a moment. But verse 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. And he's emphasizing that the men, and, and not just any man, lifting up holy hands, certain men be the ones that are going to pray. And when he says everywhere, we're talking about all the churches of the Gentiles. In verse 12, when he says, But I suffer not a woman to teach or usurp authority over the man. Now, when he, but I suffer not. Who are you, Paul? I'm Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles. And God's entrusted me with some information for the body of Christ. And, and, that, body, and that, that information involves how the body of Christ is to be organized and run. And, and so he's exhorting concerning how they're to conduct the ministry of the local church. So when you get to chapter 3, a bishop then must be, and he starts listing the qualifications of a bishop. You get down to verse 8, uh, likewise must the deacons be, and he starts listing the qualifications of a deacon. Uh, an interesting, under the deacon section, verse 11 says, even so must their wives be grave, and so forth. So that... Uh, that, that you, you got this list, and then who can be in these positions, and, uh, and they're quite authoritative in how it's listed. You get to chapter 4, and then he tells Timothy, like in verse 11, these things command and teach. <laughs> I mean, this is strong. In verse 12, let no man despise thy youth. I always think about that. Timothy was a young man, and... and He's, he's carrying out not the function of a bishop or a deacon, because one of the things is, is, a, is a bishop needs to be an elder, but there's a, a line there of, of uh, there's some age that has to be there, but the elder is also a spiritual elder in the sense that able to do the things that are listed here. Uh, but Timothy, if he's a young man, but he's not there as a 
elder or as a bishop, he's there as an apostle, sent by the apostle Paul. That's why these references about the prophecies that went before thee, he's just not any, any person that someone chose to give him some authority. He, he was chosen of God with this authority. And he goes out as an apostle with the apostle Paul. And so when he, when he goes there and, and, and charges them that they teach no other uh, doctrine, uh, he's got authority behind him. And so let no man despise thy youth. Um, carrying that on, chapter 5 and verse uh, 7. And, and this, this has to do with some social things in the church. But it says, these things give charge that they may be blameless. So, the, so Timothy, when he instructs this, he, he, he charges them with this information. Uh, verse 21, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels, and this is concerning how to deal with an elder that sins, that thou observe these things without preferring one another, doing nothing by partiality. So when Paul charges Timothy to carry these things out that are going to be tough to carry out, uh, he not only charges them, he says that he's being charged before God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the elect angels. And that's where you get to understand that uh, the body of Christ teaches things to the angelic hosts up there. And, uh, and, and, and so how Timothy carries himself out, uh, the, uh, carries out these responsibilities, there's others watching. And uh, Paul charges Timothy concerning those things. Chapter 6 and verse 13 it says, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before, Ponch, uh, before Jesus Christ, who before Pontius Pilate, uh, witnessed a good confession that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, unto the coming, uh, unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Timothy being charged uh, with, the, with the duty and the responsibility of keeping these things, and then uh, in verse 17, he charges those that are have money in this world, charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded. So it, it, it's not just uh, suggesting to the people that are rich in this world how they ought to spend their money and how they ought to think of their money. It, it's more of a charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. And he gives them those instructions. And then verse 20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings in opposition of science falsely so-called. So, when he says, oh, Timothy, keep. Now, one of the things we'll look at in a little bit is, is the fact that they're turning away from some of these things. And so, oh, Timothy, you keep them. But it's not, see, what was committed to Paul and entrusted to Paul is now entrusted to Timothy. And Timothy is telling the leadership of a local church, you're the pillar and ground of this. You're, you're entrusted with this now, and what a responsibility to first to know what the truth is, and then to, to carry out your responsibility. Now last time, we, we, I went through a thing at the end of class where we talked about um, that it wouldn't be easy uh, to carry these things out, and, and I showed you some the things that were being charged and the things that were being carried out, but I also wanted to point out that there's going to be opposition I mean, you're just not going to have it easy carrying these things out. And uh, I want to quickly just kind of go through ten of those. I, I want to do it quickly because one of, my, one of the things that I'm looking at is thinking, there is, last week it was 17, now I'm adding to it, errors that Paul confronts in 1 Timothy, the local church with. And those errors are so poignant to us, uh, right, right in front of our face, in churches around us, but we're not just pointing fingers, we better look at ourselves. And, uh, but anyhow, so, so I wanted to point out <laughs> all those things that are in here. So this is only ten of them in a different set uh, uh, for a different reason. Uh, uh, my point is, is that we were being charged, and, and in that charge it wasn't going to be easy, and one of the reasons it's not going to be easy is there's going to be opposition. Part of the opposition, as, we, as you look at as it's labeled out here back in chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, you know, that He's going to charge them to teach no other doctrine. There's going to be those that in verse 7 desire to be teachers of the law. So you're going to be teaching grace. <laughs> you're going to have some opposition because there's going to be teachers who want to teach law. In verse 19, after Paul tells Timothy to war a good, wherefore, war a good warfare, he says in chapter 1 of verse 19, holding faith, 
and a, and, a, and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. See, there's faith and a good conscience. And then, but they put away the good conscience concerning faith, and as a result, there's shipwreckness. So there's going to, men, there's going to be men without conscience uh, that, that are actually be involved in, in some form of ministry that you're going to have to uh, confront. Uh, there is, we, we talked about it the first day, it, it, the reason about praying for government and all is so that the local church can be free to carry out its responsibility, and, and the, you know, we're learning about all the responsibility we have, but when he says in chapter 2 and verse 2, that we're to pray for kings and for all that are in authority that we might lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty, well, if the church has got a mission to carry out, and there's going to be opposition. Sometimes that opposition isn't the false teachers. It can be the government itself. And that's where the reason it says pray for it, that we might lead that quiet and peaceful life. But that is a possibility that some of our op opposition is going to be the opposition of government against the things that we're teaching and, and preaching. Uh, chapter 3 and verse 6, um, it says, Not a novice, and that's, you're not to take someone and, and put him in a position of a, of a bishop who's a novice, and this is why, uh, uh, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. So you're going to have prideful leadership is going to be in opposition to the mission that we're to carry out and the church is responsible for and been entrusted to. Uh, then there is this, I just called it inconsistent testimony because in, in like in... Uh, Yeah, verse 7. It says, Moreover, he must be of good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So he can be lifted up in pride as he ministers to an assembly, but, but also he could have, he might have a good report within. Everybody looks at him as someone who's a consistent Christian life, but lost people don't look at him with consistent Christian life. And it certainly can bring reproach uh, to, to the local assembly. And, and so the inconsistency of a testimony is, is going to be an obstacle. Uh, then the obvious right here, chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So there's going to be doctrines of devils that you're going to have to, to deal with. Uh, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared, uh, seared with a hot iron. And, and so you've got the doctrine of devils. And then when you get to chapter 5, it names these different things, like a, like a widow who's living in sin, or and, and that, that she's dead while she lives in verse 6. Verse 8, it says, If any provide not for his own, especially for his own household, he is an infidel, or he is denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. What I'm pointing out is there's going to be sin within the saints of people not carrying out responsibility, either living worldly or, or not being responsible to take care of, their, of, of a widow within their family. Uh, verse 20, uh, Paul has to deal with Timothy and remind him about elders who sin. Uh, it says, um, verse 19, against an elder receive not accusation but before two or three witnesses them that sin rebuke before all that others may, may fear. So you're going to have problem with sin in the assembly. Uh, verse 24, some men's sins are open beforehand going before to judgment. Some men they follow after. <laughs> so you're going to have problem. They're going to start out good and all of a sudden there's going to be a problem. You're going to have to deal with sin in the leadership, sin in the assembly. That's certainly going to be an obstacle for carrying out the, the ministry that we're called on and entrusted to carry out. Uh, and then you got the, the, the false teachers or the teachers that are going to sway people away. We started to read about there already in chapter 6 in verse 4. But the point of this is, is when it says... Uh, uh, then verse 5 it says perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds destitute of the truth supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself so there's going to be this arrogant prideful teachers who are really out for gain and I'm not in my list of 20 things that are right before our face <laughs> but boy if that one's not before our face and, but again that's that's probably most of that is in the lost religious institution that that some of those Ministries, well, they're, they're certainly not following Timothy because they're not even following the doctrine uh, that was given to the Apostle Paul that we're, we're entrusted with. 
in verse chapter 6 and verse 10, it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which some have coveted after, have erred from the faith. And, uh, and, and so you got this, the deceitfulness of riches that are drawing people away from the faith. And then the last thing is verse uh, 20 again of chapter 6. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and opposition of science falsely so called. <laughs> There's going to be an opposition of preaching the faith because of falsely called science. And, you know, science is the pursuit of knowledge. And, uh, and, and that, that comes in all different kinds of knowledge. It might not just be uh, knowledge or disagreement about the faith. Uh, we, we just know in the world that we live in and all the knowledge that man thinks he has, it's certainly in opposition to the truth. And, uh, and so there's all these different oppositions to the truth that, uh, that we're facing as we're entrusted with this truth. So we're talking about the truth resting upon us. One of the things I want to so associate with that word truth is, is something I think is helpful um, and People use this expression, the expression of the faith. Look again at chapter 1 and verse 2. He says, Unto Timothy, my own son, in the faith. When, when we're talking about the responsibility of the local church, and by the way, I, I've shared with you before, I should share with you the letter. We get calls, you know, you're a Bible church, what do you believe? And, and we send people a statement about what we believe, but I have a personal letter that I... It's kind of like a form letter, but it was when I first started dealing with people, because we can't offer all the things of other so-called churches out there. I mean, at least now we can add a youth ministry, but we didn't have that until recently. And, uh, and you know, so we had Sunday school and, and church service. But one of the things I always wrote in this letter, and I started the letter out with it and closed with it, is that out of all the things you're seeking for a church, the number one thing you ought to be seeking for is truth. And, uh, and, and, I mean, you look at Timothy, you realize that, you know, Paul wasn't looking, he didn't instruct anything about youth ministry and WANA programs and, and uh, you know, daycare centers <laughs> and uh, even, even taking care of the sick that are outside. I mean, when we get to that chapter 5, it was care within the church. It wasn't any care for people outside, not setting up outside things. Those things are good. There's nothing wrong with them. And some churches have real big outreach and can actually bring people in because of the thing. That's all good. That's, missionaries do that and always have done that. But my point in the letter is that the first thing anybody ought to look for in a church is the truth. And then from there, build those other things. And, uh, and I'm saying that because as we talk about the church being the pillar and ground of the truth, the truth rests on us and it's our job to get it out. Everything centers around the truth. And the truth that we're talking about is sometimes in this passage and throughout all Paul's epistles is called the faith. And, you know, everyone says, keep the faith, brother, right? What do you mean by the faith? Well, when you see that there is uh, unto Timothy, my own son, in the faith. Timothy sat under Paul as a spiritual son. Now, he wasn't his physical son, but Paul took him under his wing and, and instructed Timothy in the faith. And the faith has to do with that body of truth that was committed to Paul, that Paul commits to Timothy, and he just calls it the faith. Now, there's a lot of verses about faith in Timothy, of course, but the faith is a statement that refers to the body of truth that's for us today. And, uh, and we kind of establish that by just talking about the truth. But you see the faith mentioned here in chapter 3, in verse uh, 9. It says, and this is interesting. I'll start with verse 8 again. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Well, what is the faith? Well, it's related to the mystery. The mystery of the faith is the revelation of truth that was given to the Apostle Paul. And you realize um, a deacon has to have that in a pure conscience. He understands what the body of truth is for the body of Christ. The revelation of truth that was a mystery revealed to the Apostle Paul who he gave to us. That, you know, that's Ephesians 3, 1 through 6 there. A deacon, to have that position, has to know that. That tells you most bishops in other churches don't even qualify to be a deacon because they have no idea what that is. And uh, <laughs> you, just, you just see all this. 
And because they, they didn't follow 1 Timothy, that's why the church is in the predicament it's in, or the church so-called, I guess i got to say. So, but anyhow, there's the faith there. In verse 13, it says, uh, uh, They that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So we're not just talking about faith, the faith, boldness in the truth of God, the, the doctrine for us today. Uh, chapter 4, remember that departing? Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in a latter time some shall depart from the faith. And, you know, everyone thinks, well, you got your faith, and there's the faith of that assembly. There's no such thing. There's the faith, the body of truth. In fact, if it hadn't clicked on to you yet... Turn to Ephesians. It's worth looking. This message that was given to the Apostle Paul is a message that's certainly the glorious gospel of the blessed God, but it's, it's the whole revelation of truth for the body of Christ. In Ephesians 3, in verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles... If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a and few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel." This, this truth of information that God is, what God's accomplishing in this age of grace today is called a mystery given to Paul for us Gentiles and, and to him was given this whole body of truth for us. So that when you get to chapter 4, after he has given us the doctrine of Ephesians, he says in chapter 4 verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. We're, we got a vocation. That's not, that's not a hobby. That's your life calling. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there's one body and one Spirit, even as you're called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, there it is, one faith. Now we always pound on people because they don't see the one baptism, but there, there's only one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's above all, through all, and in you all. So this unity, that, that this thing that we're to keep is this unity and there's a one faith. And so as we're going through that first Timothy and, and all these expressions, they're going to depart from the faith. What faith are they going to depart from? The glorious gospel, the blessed God that was committed to Paul's trust. That Paul committed all that teaching to Timothy. He committed it to the local assemblies whose job is to maintain it throughout the generations. And... Uh, and the problem at, at, at the Ephesus there is that they were beginning to turn away from it. But let me, let me finish out the, the words about faith there. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. Even in the practical section here, if any provide not for his own, especially those of his own house, his own house he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So the teaching does involve some responsibility within assembly and within, look, and within families and the care of, of the family. And then uh, uh, chapter 6 and verse 10, it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith. The things that God has called us to and, and revealed to us, that money the, and the love of it has drawn them away from that and pierced themselves through with many a sorrow. Uh, and then chapter uh, 6 and verse 21 there, some professing concerning that science falsely so called have erred concerning the faith. And so the, there's this body of truth that's been revealed to us, first entrusted to Paul, and as you've seen in the verses, certainly entrusted to Timothy, and now entrusted to each and every one of us as members, local assemblies, uh, where the pillar and ground that we're to be the pillar and ground and truth of, of making sure that no other doctrine is taught. And uh, so anyhow, that, I, I know we've said all those things the last two times, but just looking at it in different ways, uh, 
just the responsibility and our calling is so clear in the passage that uh, went through it again this way. Uh, we'll go through the list next time concerning the, the list of things that people are departing from and going to and, and just, just as a, a warning and, uh, and because we're in no hurry to go anywhere else, we're going to take the time to look at just how in every chapter, in the six chapters that Paul warns about so many things that, that people aren't taking uh, responsibility of and, and uh, standing for. I say peaceful? Yeah. I know it's peaceable. I didn't know I said peaceful. Peaceful. And you got a little bit de clearer, de define it since you've gone well, that far. I don't have a definition for it, but I am curious about it. You know, I, when I found out it wasn't in the King James, I looked to see if it was any counterfeit Bibles. Normally they reverse the order and say peaceful and quiet, but there is one in the ASV that says quiet and yeah. Now I know that if I'm talking about the verse, I say peaceful, but I, I didn't realize when I was reading the verse I was saying peaceful because I knew it said that. But uh, that's what I thought peaceable was. <laughs> but you know, it, it wasn't until this last, well, the, the beginning of, of the overview of Timothy that I looked at. I, I always knew that in chapter two, when it talks about the men praying, that. We're not talking about home. We're, to, we're actually talking about a, a function within an assembly and responsibilities within that assembly. Uh, but I never associated why Paul starts out with w praying, telling us to, to pray for kings and for all that are in authority. And then uh, when, I, when I kept the context clear in my mind, especially what we did is we went back into the book of Acts and realized the riot that took place when Paul was at Ephesus, uh, then you can see how well, actually, government helped him out in that situation, but it could have went the other way, too. And so he says, pray for government so that we can carry out on our business. And, and, I, and the context became clearer to me. All right, let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you um, for the truth that we're studying here. Uh, Father, I, I'm, I appreciate the fact that years ago, before um, I set out to fill the office of a bishop and and work in that capacity that uh, I was presented with the truth of right division so that, uh, that the years of ministry uh, were centered around the truth. And, and Father, we know that there's more things to discover and, and more accurate ways of declaring the truth that we know, but we know what the truth is, where the body of truth that we're to be, that the truth is resting on us and that we're responsible for, we know what it is and where to find it. And, uh, and we pray that we'll have the, uh, your grace in us to live it too. But Father, uh, it just shows the responsibility of a local church and, uh, and how short so many come, but more, more so the responsibility on our part to get it out and known to others so they too can rejoice in the wonderful grace that you've given us in Christ. So thank you for this passage and this book. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.